screen and you can start. Everyone's in. All right. It says recording in progress, so that's a good thing. Awesome. Thank and you, Dr. Gilbert. Share that screen. Thank you. All right. So we'll share desktop one. And I think we are ready to roll. Except I need to put it on slideshow. All right, so just quickly before we go, can everybody see it as, as filling the screen? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, sorry, everybody. We had a few moments of technical difficulties because I'm not used to being the host, so I apologize for that. I'm Robert Gilbert. I'm a radiation oncologist, and we're going to be talking about some emerging trends in radiation therapy for breast cancer. And really, it's more about a, a journey that, that just, just as the people who see us have to take a, a journey that they'd rather not. Ours is also a, more of a journey in how we got here and where we're headed more so than an earth shattering uh, change. But I think some of you, if you've been through a treatment or known people who've gone through treatment, some of this will be um, you know, a little bit of a revelation about, about how things are hopefully gonna change in the future and make things easier. So the outline for the talk is that we're gonna talk about a statement of the problem. So basically, you know, what's the current status of breast cancer uh, in the country? How did we get here? And that's really from a radiation standpoint. Let me cut that phone off. I apologize for that. It's my, one of my spam calls for the day. Um, how did we get here? So that's more from just radiation historically. How did we get here? changing the dose and the number of treatments. And that's really been our biggest shift and, and the biggest change uh, for us, changing the volume. Do we need to treat as much techniques? What sort of things do we use now that we didn't use before? And how do we use them to make things easier? Seeing more clearly, and this is really our next biggest advancement. And that's really our biggest technological advancement for the last five years is you know being able to see things better and being able to control uh, and allow the patient to control what's happening in the room so that they get a better treatment. Uh, reducing toxicity, always important for everybody. Uh, replacing potentially more toxic treatment. Everyone likes to claim that their treatment is not toxic and every other treatment is toxic, but in truth, we're all toxic to some degree. And so we want to want to make whatever happens when we treat breast cancer the least toxic it can be, and then figuring out when not to treat. I think that that's always uh, an issue that historically we treated everybody and, and really that's not necessary. So that continues to evolve. And then we're just gonna have a quick conclusion at the end. So a statement of the problem, we're gonna talk a little bit about incidents, uh, some changes in the, in the more recent staging, which is the eighth version of the, the uh, national staging protocol. Uh, survival by time from initial treatment. I skipped one, survival by stage. People just kind of want to know overall, if they give me this stage, you know, what, what am I looking at? And, and maybe do I need to ask more questions? Survival by age and then treatment by stage. So for this year, the expected incidence for invasive cancer, so cancer that's gotten through the wall of the breast duct, is a little over uh, 250,000. It's 281,500 or so. And then non-invasive that's not gotten outside the breast duct is uh, close to 50,000. So we're looking at a little bit over 300,000 invasive and non-invasive cases. The average lifetime female risk is about 13%. We'll throw, go ahead and throw men in there since I'm one of them and that, that's maybe closer to 1%. Uh, so it's, it's very unusual uh, for a male uh, or an X, XY uh, genetics fella to, to get that. All right, new staging. So really the biggest change with the current staging system, it's the same as the seventh edition, except we added biology. And so that's mainly whether it's sensitive to hormones, uh, progesterone and estrogen, and another marker called HER2, which is a surface marker that can be associated with more aggressively acting cancers. We don't consider that a negative anymore because the drugs that are targeted at it work so well. So if these things are positive or negative, it can actually uh, raise or lower what's called the prognostic stage. And we treat based on that. And all this is based on information that shows 
that these patients have done better or worse than their normal stage. So that's why the stage got changed. But you may be told that you have two stages. And I always share two stages with my patients. Sometimes it's the same stage. So if it's a hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, and they're relatively low stage already, they're going to stay low stage. But sometimes you can have a stage two anatomically, and it actually ends up being a stage one prognostically just because the biology looks so good. So that, that's something important to know. And that's definitely a change in the way we generally manage radiation or not radiation, breast cancer, sorry. Survival by stage, and this is five-year survival. This is overall survival. So stage zero, it's non-invasive breast cancer, 100%. And that's what you'd expect, that, that nobody's gonna likely die from non-invasive breast cancer. Stage one, it's almost as good at 99%. Stage two, which is where it's a little bit bigger tumor, bigger than two centimeters, which is a little under an inch, or uh, with a few nodes positive, it drops to 95%. Stage three is when the tumors are generally bigger than five centimeters, which is two inches, or there are significant nodes, uh, then it drops to 72%. And stage four, where it's moved to another part of the body, it, it drops to 27. Those numbers continue to improve. These are a few years old. Uh, the last one is improving primarily because of medical oncology. I wish I could take any credit for that, but really we have very little role in the improving survival for stage four, but it's still a, a difficult stage to have when it's moved into another part of the body. Uh, survival by time from initial treatment. So this is all comers, all stages. At five years out from initial treatment, it's 90% survival. So that's really quite good overall. And that, that reflects the fact that we find a lot of the breast cancers in an early stage, which is very helpful for those, those patients, but also helpful to keep that overall number higher. At 10 years, it drops to 84%. At 15 years, it drops to 80%. And if you continue to draw that line out to, 50, to 20 years, 25 years, and 30 years, you'd see a continued decline in that. And that's reflecting the fact that some particularly hormone receptor positive cancers tend to come, they don't tend to, they can, they can rarely come back really late. So, you know, we used to say, hey, gosh, if you're five years out, you're, you're cured, but it's probably important not to say it that way. The longer you're disease free, the safer you are that you're cured. But unfortunately, there's always a teeny tiny risk that it could come back even at that late late time frame, 15, 20 years, although it's extremely unusual. Uh, survival by age, really the only point of this is if you're between 45 and 75, they do the best. And that's really a reflection of the biology that they that group tends to have a more favorable histology. And so it's, it's natural that they would live a little bit longer or more of them would live, be alive. Once you get past 74, the comorbidities, they, they, they may not be able to take the full treatment. And below age 45, we see more aggressive cancers, not that it has to be that. Uh, stage for stage and grade for grade, meaning the level of disease and how ugly it is under the microscope, a younger woman will do just as well as an older woman with that same set of, um, of data. All right, treatment by stage. So you'll see a progression here. I'll make this quick because I know we want to catch everything that I, that, that I have in here. Stage zero, it's usually surgery. That's non-invasive cancer. Uh, if it's a mastectomy for that woman, she doesn't really need anything else particularly. If she's had a lumpectomy or partial mastectomy, then we're usually going to add radiation. But as you'll see a little later in the talk, not always. And we may or may not add anti-hormonal therapy, something to block estrogen uh, as, as a preventative from, a, from getting additional tumors down the road. Stage one, again, surgery is the mainstay, remove the tumor. Uh, if they've had a lumpectomy or partial mastectomy, add some radiation, unless there's some features that we talk about a little later in the talk. Uh, if they're hormone receptor positive, add anti-hormonal therapy. And if they're high risk, meaning that biologically it's very aggressive disease and they, that, that individual, that set of individuals has a higher risk of it coming back and maybe causing their death, they may be offered chemotherapy. Stage two, that's where, again, it's a little bit larger tumor or maybe a few nodes. Again, surgery is the mainstay. Chemotherapy becomes more important in that age group. So I put that before radiation and then radiation a little 
less. And again, if that patient's had a mastectomy and may, maybe he has one or two nodes, they don't need radiation. Or if they just had a larger tumor, but they didn't have any nodes and they've had a mastectomy, they almost assuredly don't need uh, radiation, and then anti-hormonal therapy if appropriate. For stage three, it's everything. I put chemo first because chemotherapy first because, again, those women survival. Sorry about that. Uh, those women survival uh, is really more driven by them getting systemic therapy. Not all all women will choose to get it but it is more important in that group for sure. So I put it first, followed by surgery, followed by radiation, but generally that group gets all three for sure, plus or minus anti-hormonal therapy should they, um, should they be hormone receptor positive. Stage four, chemotherapy for sure, plus or minus anti-hormonal therapy if they're hormone receptor positive. And sometimes we and surgery may be useful in giving those women a better quality of life and a better length of life, but it's really systemic therapy, something that's given by vein or by mouth that, that's gonna be the determinant of how well that group does. Uh, how did we get here? So again, this is talking about radiation. So using the, the topics here are gonna be using radiation in place of more comprehensive surgery, i.e. mastectomy, older techniques. We're gonna talk a little bit about what we used to do and why that was bad and older dosing strategies. Uh, so starting back in the late 1960s, there were a set of trials in Europe that were smaller. They were followed by larger trials in the early 1970s, and then a, a much larger trial in the United States that started in 1976. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the U.S. trial here in a minute. They generally looked at early stage breast cancer. They compared mastectomy to removing part of the breast and then adding radiation. The interesting thing about the um, American trial is it also looked at removing the tumor with a lumpectomy, but then not giving radiation. Uh, and they all found basically the same thing, that adding the radiation to the lumpectomy made it the effective equivalent of the mastectomy. So it started to have a, a change in how we manage breast cancer, early stage breast cancer. So this is from the American trial. This is 20 year data. So it's pretty good, pretty good information that for disease free survival, meaning the chances of you being alive at that time without any, and that's for any cause without, without breast cancer. It, I'm so sorry. Um, I'll get to her in a bit. Um, it, it's, it's another doctor. Sorry. Uh, that there's not really a big change in the disease-free survival, the distant, or in other words, getting metastasis survival or overall survival. The curve shifted a little bit with the patients that had just lumpectomy alone, but if you get out to 20 years, it's almost back to the same. So uh, having a mastectomy, the, the ultimate outcome still is not necessary for all patients. Uh, older techniques, we used to actually do this by walking into the room sort of having a feel for where the edges of the breast were and putting the uh, marks on that we were going to use to treat based on that. Sometimes you had somebody that had a little bit more fat, you might overestimate how much of them needed to be treated. And if there was not much breast tissue, you may miss a good bit of the breast tissue. So that was a, a relatively primitive, but we still were pretty good at it. And then we would actually just set a distance from the machine to the patient and base it on how thick the patient was. And there was really no evaluation of how much dose got to what part of the breast or other tissues. So things were, again, a little bit primitive compared to what we do today. Then we use cobalt. Now, a lot of people will refer, usually older, older individuals will refer to cobalt as radiation or vice versa. Radiation therapy is cobalt therapy. That used to be about all we had throughout most of the country. And it typically, um, was very skin toxic. So a lot of the horror stories for both breast cancer and other cancers that we hear about bad radiation burns, a lot of that came from cobalt where the entire breast would get burned. And so we don't use that in this country for sure anymore. Full axillary nodal radiation. So used to, if your nodes were positive, we'd just cover your whole nodes, didn't matter how much surgery you had. Uh, that was the more common way to handle it. Today, we don't always and frequently don't uh, treat the whole axilla or underarm area. 
but that was a, a classic way to do it. And then deep coverage of the nodes by the breastbone. So those are the internal mammary nodes. So they're right along the breastbone. And we've found that they're more important than we used to believe. Uh, better chemotherapy has made us uh, essentially the need to treat the internal mammary nodes more, more relevant and more important. Uh, at some, one point, it didn't really matter in the survival of those women if, if their internal mammary nodes failed or not, but that's not necessarily and usually not true today. Uh, hang on, didn't click. All right, so older dosing strategies. And so if you came to see one of us 20 years ago, we probably would have said you're going to have five to five and a half weeks to the whole breast or the chest wall and maybe the nodes. And then we're going to give you another five to eight treatments to where the tumor was removed or where the skin came together for the mastectomy. And some doctors like to give the, the eight extra treatments to those, those smaller areas. Some like to give the five but you could get up to 36 treatments, which is a little over seven weeks of radiation. So that was all comers, everyone. And it's never a good idea when everybody gets the same thing. So really our advances have been a progressive evolution towards who do we not need to do this to? Who do we maybe not need to do it to at all? and making things better for women as far as well as a few techniques that actually reduce our toxicity. So the first thing that we started looking at, and this dates back to the 1990s, uh, was can we get away with less? And this started in countries that have what you would call socialized medicine. So the government pays for all the healthcare, they buy the machines, it's run through a government hot set of hospitals. And our machines are very expensive. Even when they started that, they were, they were a couple of million dollars. And now they're, they're up to $10 million a piece, depending on what you get. So you don't want to buy any more of those for the entire country than you have to. So they started looking at shorter courses of therapy based on some older biological studies saying we can do just as well by giving less but a little bit more per day and not have a worse outcome uh, cosmetically, meaning that the, there won't be more side effects to the breast tissue, but we'll still get the same benefit. And then uh, phase two and phase three are more recent in the last decade. And those are progressively moving towards only giving five treatments and now only in a week. So for some women, things are a lot better than they used to be. So, so for phase one of that, Again, these were all in the 90s and were reported out in either the late 90s or the early 2000s, and they all have more than 20 years of data now. Uh, is the rapid trial from Europe, the uh, Ontario Cooperative Oncology Group, and that's out of Canada, and then Start A and Start B are from, from the UK or Britain. Uh, basically, all of them showed the same thing, which is giving 15 to 16 treatments was just as good as giving 25, not counting the boost there was no worse uh, cosmetic outcome and there was no worse control outcome, meaning the cancer didn't come back more often. So uh, starting in the early 2000s, we really started pushing towards giving appropriate women who were hormone receptor positive and early stage one or two, giving them this treatment, particularly if they were over the age of 50. Uh, I know I changed that in the early, like I think it was 2004 when we started it. Uh, phase two started at the very end of the 2000s or the aughts and continued on into the 2000 teens. The trial that's most associated with that is called the FAST trial. That's out of the UK. Again, they're trying to cut down their use if they can get away with it. But we also had a similar trial that was run out of the University uh, of Louisville. And it was delivering a single dose of radiation once a week for five weeks. And it was a lot more radiation. Um, they were really looking at that more to just make sure it wasn't going to hurt the patient more and it was not going to cause more uh, breast issues. And it was equivalent to the traditional dosing. And interestingly, even though they had all the other trials that had shown that you could get away with 15, they compared it to the 25 to the whole breast. Uh, again, this was for early stage breast cancers, but it just showed us we could at least uh, from a problem standpoint, get away with it. So they then moved it into fast forward 
uh, which was the name of the most recent trial that has at least uh, six and a half to seven year data now. They delivered all five treatments in a week, and this time they did compare it to that relatively shorter course of 15 to 16. It was again for early stage breast cancer, stage one and two. Interestingly, it allowed a boost, that extra dose that you can give to where the tumor is removed up to an additional eight treatments. And I never did understand this in this one or any of the previous trials. Why would you go to all the trouble to shorten the whole breast treatment and then leave the same number of treatments for the boost if you allowed it? So in that group of women who they felt needed a boost, and we're going to talk about that in a little, a little bit later as well, um, they were allowing eight additional treatments. So it kind of blows, blows the, the whole thing about, oh, I can do this really quickly because that's two and a half weeks. It's still better than four weeks, but it's not the promise of having it done in a week. Uh, so it's best reserved for women who don't need a boost. And that's generally women who are 50 and older or hormone receptor positive, meaning they, their tumors are sensitive to estrogen and progesterone. They're grade one or two, and those typically are a little closer in grade three, which is the higher and more aggressive, is off by itself, uh, or, and negative margins. And they get the best reduction. So you can have the treatment in as few as five treatments. There are some partial breast treatments that it's done at the time of surgery that you can have done in one day. That's not mainstream, even though it is offered throughout the country. And I did not put it in today's talk because of that. So changing the volume. So this kind of is a segue into we do, do we have to have a boost? You know, why do we try to give that extra treatment? And do we have to treat lymph nodes? Because that's a source of a lot of potential complications for women. Um, so the boost add control, but they generally, in most cases, don't add survival. But there is an exception to that. And that's if they have grade three disease, there are actually several exceptions. Grade three disease, very close, meaning less than five millimeters or positive margins, meaning there's tumor at the cut surface or their hormone receptor negative, they actually get a survival benefit uh, presently by adding that extra treatment. And a lot of that was based on a European trial, which you don't need to remember that name or that number, but, but that was a pan-European trial. And it, it did give us some, some clarity about who really has a true benefit as opposed to just maybe helps it keep it from coming back, which we would all like, but doesn't add to that person's survival and may add to their complications. Do we have to treat lymph nodes? Well, not always. Um, if you have one or two nodes and you're hormone receptor positive, there may not be a whole lot of added benefit. You know, uh, there were some studies done that were presented back in the night late 1990s that suggested anybody with a lymph node positive get radiation. And we spent the last 20 plus years trying to figure out if that's really true or not. And in some cases, it's just almost no benefit. So it's really hard to push that relatively favorable, but node positive patient to definitely getting lymph node radiation. A complete response to upfront chemotherapy. So a lot of times with somewhat more advanced cancers, now we're giving the chemotherapy up front. In fact, that's more common to be done now. Uh, if those women are hormone receptor positive and they have a complete response, meaning the pathologist can't find any evidence of uh, residual breast cancer in the lymph nodes or in the breast, they're probably not going to get much benefit either, that their disease is probably been brought under optimal control with the chemotherapy already and the surgery, and they can probably get away without having radiation, uh, to, certainly to their nodes, and if they've had a mastectomy, probably not to the chest wall either. Uh, outside of this, the trials have stubbornly shown that there is a benefit in node-positive patients without those two situations. Um, if they do a full axillary dissection, that's got a higher risk of, of lymphedema, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And this is not something new, but we continue to forget it. We don't have to treat the whole underarm or axilla. We can block out the area that's been dissected, and that really reduces the risks. So techniques, there's three things I'm going to talk about. One is, is 3D uh, treatment, which is what it sounds like. It's looking at it in three dimensions. One is IMRT, we're going to describe what that means and, and what that acronym means, and then proton therapy. So if any of you have looked into breast cancer radiation, you're bound to, if you look it up on Google, you're bound to come across ads for proton therapy and maybe some other articles for it. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and have some pictures. 3D radiation, you're basically just looking at the dose in three dimensions. You're looking at normal structures. You're looking at what you want to cover. You're just making sure in the, 
historically, we would look at one slice on the CT and if everything looked good, we assumed it was good everywhere else. And some of those women got really bad burns or in some cases got severely underdosed because we really weren't looking at the whole picture. We were just looking at that one slice. So uh, really no one does unless they just don't have the availability and that's typically not in this country. They look at it at least in three dimensions. Uh, can be better than other mainstream radiation treatments, which is basically IMRT at reducing lung and heart dose. We're going to look at that on a picture when we get to IMRT, but sometimes doing it a newer, more expensive way actually can have negatives. And that's definitely true for, for heart and lung dose with 3D versus IMRT. Uh, Three-dimensional treatment is also the most widely available. There's nobody in this country who does what I do, no matter when they were trained, that doesn't understand at this point how to do three-dimensional breast, breast planning. Um, so it's something that everyone has a lot of experience. And again, in many cases, it may be the, the safer and the better one. Uh, but this is what we typically are looking at with a plan. Uh, even though I'm only showing you a single slice, we would be able to go through that. We'd also be able to look at it from front to back and side to side. One of the things I wanna point out is this little cartoon part or, or pictogram that shows something that looks kind of like a doorstop or a triangle. Those are called wedges and they make up for the fact that the breast is kind of sloped and not like, like a box. They did present a problem and we don't use those anymore, but I kind of left this picture in because it will be helpful when we talk about dose to the opposite breast in a, in a few minutes. Um, this is just showing coverage of the lymph nodes and uh, the chest wall in this case. And again, we're seeing, you can see, if you can see the little arrow coming down, that there's a whole lot of lung. So why would we want that much lung? Well, it may be necessary if that person has a very curved chest wall to get the entire chest wall at risk, but that is more lung than we would normally want to see covered in any slice. All right, intensity modulated radiation therapy. So if you hear IMRT, that's what that stands for. And it actually works like a 3D printer. So it, you know, I just mentioned 3D and now I'm telling you this is not 3D, but when you do a 3D printing of something off your computer, it's basically pinpointing a little bit of heat or a little bit of, of electricity at a certain point in a solvent or a solution to actually make something solid. Well, we're making radiation dose that, that is discrete to little volumes within the, the, in this case, the breast or chest wall and the lymph nodes. And when you add them all together, you get this picture of what you want to treat. And in that way, and just conceptually, it's easy to think about, hey, this is like a 3D printer. It is a somewhat newer technique than 3D. It has not been used in breast for as long, but it's still a little long in the tooth compared to something that's you know truly new and revolutionary. You can give a lot higher doses the things you wanna give higher doses to and spare some things that you'd rather not get treatment to that have a fairly reasonable tolerance for radiation. But what it can also do is give an undesirable dose to structures, normal structures that have a low tolerance and lung is our problem there. And I'm gonna show you that with this next picture. So you can start to see problems in lung with as little as, as five gray or 500 centigrade. Again, this is a dose of radiation. You guys don't need to remember the dose, but it's very similar to an old one and that's why we use it. So that's like the, the you'll hear us say the 500 line. And when too much of the lung gets 500 or more, you're looking at much more serious problems with that person's breathing down the road. So if you can see the arrow, there's sort of a blue area, almost the entire lung on this person's right side is covered by at least the dark blue, even though there's a lot deeper area that's covered by the, the redder or more orange colors, which is higher dose, you still got this area that's just hardly getting any radiation here towards the back. So for this particular person, the three-dimensional treatment probably was the safer option, even though it didn't give the good coverage, as good a coverage or as con, uh, conformal coverage for the doses that we're prescribing. Again, you gotta look at everything and it's gotta be safe. Sometimes IMRT is safe and it looks better. Sometimes it's actually not the right thing to do, even though it's newer and snazzier and costs more. Uh, proton therapy, so that's a good segue into proton therapy. We don't have a proton unit. 
Uh, most of them in the country are about a hundred plus million dollars, and that's just very difficult to get. Uh, they, as I just said, are very expensive, and the daily treatment can be as much as eight times more than normal treatment. Uh, but it can give dose. It works. You know, the way that it works is actually it's what we call particulate radiation. You don't need to remember that term. It's like shooting ping, uh, ping pong balls at something versus shooting a beam of light, like a, a flashlight. And so that ping pong ball is going to stop. You may shoot it hard enough to get it a few millimeters in the skin, but it's going to stop at some point and it's all going to stop. Whereas the light continues to shine through a little bit. It's very similar to that analogy. Uh, so we can we can treat to fairly high doses to the area we want to treat and almost nothing underneath that or deeper than that. It's not frequently covered by insurance because it is very expensive. And more importantly, because even though we can show that we can spare the heart a little bit better <clears throat> with more modern regular radiation techniques, we found that we're not seeing any clinical difference or not significant clinical difference. So it's just really hard to justify going and spending six weeks or even four weeks in another location and possibly having it not covered when it may not be better as far as the treating the cancer it's not any better and causing complications it may no longer be that much better but certainly it's something to always ask about it's it's reasonable and we should always be willing to talk about it and i'm not i'm not offended if somebody goes and has it it's not bad therapy it's just they probably paid a lot more than they needed uh, to have something that's not really going to be tremendously safer. Uh, so this is three-dimensional treatment versus proton therapy. And you'll see that, you know, there is some dose getting into the heart, that, but it's, it's relatively modest dose. And we're going to go over that when we talk about heart complications and what we've done to improve that. But it's hardly any dose to the heart. And I mean, you can't beat a picture. But again, is that is that picture clinically significant or does it just look good on a screen? And I think the truth is more to that, but not 100%. I mean, if, if we just said, no, nah, we don't care, we're gonna treat all the way across where that air is going to cross, we're gonna cause significant problems with that person's heart. Uh, so we still have to have to look at what are we having to treat before we make a decision whether this is safer or not. Uh, seeing more clearly, now this is really where I think our our true advances in the last few years technically have come. So we're going to talk a little bit about image guidance, which is some is old and some is new, respiratory monitoring. So that's either gating when the machine can come on and off by where we are in the breathing cycle or having somebody breathe in really deep and holding it and being able to tell when they're having to let it out. And then surface monitoring. And surface monitoring is probably the, the relatively new frontier for us in being able to not only tell when somebody's shifting out of position or not breathing correctly, but also allowing that person to control their treatment and making them better and better at actually setting up every day. And again, there's, there's some beauty to having control when you really have seem to have very little otherwise. So that's going to be a fun one to talk about here in a second. So image, image guidance, we're talking about looking, and this is the classic way with orthogonal imaging. So that's just two sets of images that are 90 degrees apart. Uh, and that, that's the traditional looks like older x-rays. There's CT imaging where we actually do a daily CT. And I, I use that a lot for my boost of the, in the intact breast because they can be a little hard to see. And even if they put in markers to tell us where it is, sometimes we don't always see them, but you can always see them on the CT. So it just gives us a little more accuracy with giving the boost. And then the next thing, and that's something that the, university has invested a fair amount of money on is an upcoming MRI based uh, radiation machine that will allow us to see things much more clearly. We've had some very generous donors that have helped us do this because that machine is is close to $10 million and, and we were very thankful. It's not going to make as huge a difference for regular breast treatments, but if we have recurrences that occur in lymph nodes, particularly those ones along the breastbone, or we've got a solitary um, area where it failed in another part of the body that's still potentially curable, we can do that much better by being able to see that with the MRI imaging. So we're going to look at some examples of that. So this is what I normally see. And this is looking at a front and side picture. 
And so we're looking to see where the spine is, where the chest wall is. And the chest wall is the, the ribs and the breastbone coming along here, spines here, edge of the chest wall here and spine here. We're able to line those patients up very quickly saving them time and discomfort, but also feel that we're being more accurate by using that kind of imaging. And so that's what's been in place for about the last 15 years. This is showing looking at a tumor bed, if they didn't put markers in for me, we can still see the tumor bed and actually shift from the daily, which is called a cone beam CT, over to what we expected and merge those one on top of the other and be much more sure that we're treating what you're coming in to have treated if you need to. MRI imaging, again, is not really that much better for just regular old breast cancer, but if you do have one of those unique situations where it's come back, which we hope you never have, or uh, it's in another part of the body, which we also hope you don't have, this may allow us to target that more easily, see it more clearly, reduce toxicity, and improve the chances it's going to come under control. This is going to be extremely important over a wide variety of cancers. Um, and you know it's not the future, but it's part of the future. And uh, it also will allow us to detect when intact tumors are responding better or worse to radiation so that we can either stop early because we're not doing them any good or see that they've, they've reduced in volume and actually while they're getting treated from day to day, reduce reduce the amount of normal tissue that's being radiated. So there's some really exciting things coming with that. Uh, respiratory monitoring or gating, in this case it's gating, it allows us to treat that person in a single phase of their breathing cycle. We usually split the breathing cycle up into 10 phases, maybe two or three of them, maybe just one. It allows us to better get the heart and the lung out of the, the treatment volume. It's generally uh, used during maximum inspiration because when we Taking a deep breath like I just did, it tends to move a lot of the lung out of where we're going to treat and it helps move the heart away. Um, but if we're going to treat lymph nodes and a chest wall or lymph nodes in a breast, we need to make sure that we're doing all of that in the same phase. Because if you take a deep breath in for your, for your, your breast treatment and then you let it out or breathe normally with the uh, lymph node treatment, you may be over intermittently or completely overlapping an area which could lead to some damage to nervous tissue or, or uh, you know, lung tissue, which we don't wanna do in either case. So it's important that we use that same set of phases for all parts of that treatment. So typically what we do is we just put a little box that's usually on the belly or on the chest. When we're treating the chest, we put it on the belly when we're treating the belly because we're trying to see things like kidneys move, we'll put it on the chest. But there are, there's a set of uh, stereo cameras, so it's almost like our eyes. It sees in three dimensions that allows us to track that box in, in space. And we can watch that patient move within a, uh, a range of, of breathing and say, I only want to treat the top up here. And that's when the breath is, is in, and maybe from here to here, and that will again better spare that person's lung and, and their heart. So deep inspiration breath hold is another way of doing this. It's just a little more uh, effort from the patient. So we have you take in a deep breath and hold it, and we can still watch for, for everything, but we're watching to see if you're in the same zone uh, of taking that deep breath. Because we don't normally breathe that way, this actually allows more air to be in the lungs, which further improves the lung dose and the heart dose. So it's really the, the type of treatment that we want to give if we're accounting for respiration. The machine cuts off automatically if you're outside the range. And again, it's similar to the gating, except it may be better because you're getting more air in those lungs. Uh, this is a little, little pictogram or pic picture of that. And it's just showing the heart that when you take the deep breath, again, it's, it's a different area of the heart because the heart's moved down and it's much easier to, to exclude it and get, do, and get clinical outcomes that are much closer to proton therapy. So we really like the deep inspiration breath hold. Surface monitoring. So again, this is kind of our new wave. And even though I said passive and then I'm saying something, somebody does something, it, I'm talking about for the machine. So the machine is passive in that. It's just essentially... It's monitoring with a surface camera. Um, and then if the therapists see that that patient's moved out of position or their breathing's gotten off by monitoring their chest, 
they cut the machine off. Then there's interactive, and that's really the neater thing. So there's a couple of ways we can do this, and it's usually done with room color, that the machine cuts itself automatically if you're out of range or if you've moved out of position, but you can have visual feedback, and it's usually a room-wide a room wide feedback that allows you to know, hey, either my breathing's gone in and out, I'm either took too deep a breath in or not a deep enough one, or I've let up too much air out, or I moved my arm and I shouldn't have, or I coughed a little bit and I'm just too much out of position. Uh, with that feedback, many of the patients that have used that type of system have been able to, to adjust themselves and get the machine turned back on before the therapist ever have to do it or come into the room. And it's a learned experience. So, you know, the first couple of times, nope, you have to come back in. But once, once those people figure out what they have to do, they frequently can turn that room green again. So this is for the breathing, but, but it's very similar without the blue for the positioning. Uh, when you haven't taken enough air in for breathing, it's blue. When you get into range, it's green. When you get too much air in, it turns red or orange, and they can just let a little air out. They see when they're in green and then continue to hold it. You don't need somebody calling in the room all the time with a, uh, a speaker that you can't hear. You've got a direct cue that, hey, it's not where it's supposed to be. And the same thing for movement. You can switch that over. It's just usually green and red. The green is when you're in proper position and you can see the room starting to change as you move out of position. And then that particular individual can move right back and control it themselves. And we found historically with any biofeedback that pa the, the patients undergoing therapy are much more satisfied and they, they really do, again, get a sense of control of their treatment that they've not ever had before. And I think we, we've ended up with, with um, quicker treatments, better treatments, and again, people being more satisfied, which is ultimately we want the cancer cured, but we also want people to be satisfied with what they've done. So reducing toxicity. So we're going to talk about four things. We're going to talk about heart, lung, the opposite breast. And remember those wedge-shaped uh, drawings that I showed you before that look like a, a doorstop. And then edema, which is kind of one of the, the more dreaded ones that, that, that uh, people actually see. Um, for heart, it's mainly heart attacks, wall motion uh, defects or deficits, and clot formation as a result of those deficits. Um, excuse me. The higher the dose of radiation, the more likely it is to happen, particularly if that's overall in the breast or overall in the heart. Uh, the average dose of about 250 centigrade, which is just a little over a traditional day's worth, begins to show a measurable effect in, in the heart. So we try to keep that number way lower than that. I've gotten most of mine down to 50 centigrade per day, so one-fifth of that threshold. Uh, and so we're starting to see, again, very similar cardiac toxicity profiles to proton with a lot less. It, it is a learning. And as I said, this is an evolutionary talk because that's how it's worked. We've not made these huge advances all of a sudden, although we get those trials showing, hey, you can give less. It's been a, a steady, steady tortoise kind of race. Uh, but we are getting better and better with that. And that has been very helpful with uh, cardiac toxicity. The use of the deep inspiration breath hole and less so gating or proton, just because you're, you're getting less heart, always safer. And if internal mammary nodes, those ones along the breastbone don't need to be treated, let's not do it because that just adds extra toxicity in those cases for no benefit. Um, Lung toxicity, it's mainly inflammation and fibrosis, and it's really long-term fibrosis. We try to keep the amount getting more than 2,000 to a bare minimum, but even getting 500 centigrade, as I showed you with the picture with the IMRT, can be dangerous. It's better with uh, deep inspiration breath hole or proton, kind of like the heart. And again, do you really need to treat nodes? Uh, evaluating, this is something we call the dose volume histogram. Uh, we want the things that we want to treat to be more over to this side. That means that all of it's getting a certain dose that we want it to get. On the other side, we want to see the, do the percentage getting a certain dose fall off really quickly because the faster this falls off, the less likely we are to have complications. That's just for your information. If you happen to go with somebody who has, is having breast radiation or you're set to have it or you've had it in the past, this is the sort of thing we look at to tell whether this is a safe plan or not. The opposite breast. So when we were using the wedge-shaped uh, devices, 
a lot of the radiation kind of bounced off and was deviated into the opposite breast. And even modest doses of, of uh, breast radiation, modest to, to the therapy docs, can lead to approximately a 3% chance of a breast cancer above what's expected. Um, that dose is usually about 1,000 to, to 1,500. We're much less than that now, unless uh, we are having to treat the uh, lymph nodes next to the breastbone, or we've got somebody with inflammatory, which is an infection. It looks like an infection, but it's a breast cancer. Those women need to have much broader margins. They're going to have some of their opposite breasts treated, and it's appropriate to do so because if we don't, they're going to definitely have a much bigger problem soon from their uh, disease that they actually have had rather than worrying about something, you know, that's seven to 15 years in the future. But we are always worried about that. We're always trying to minimize it. And it's mainly keeping the dose out of that opposite breast. Edema. I think this is probably the scariest one for a lot of, of women because they can see it and they generally know somebody who's had it. So it's much worse with full axillary and full radi uh, full axillary dissection and full axillary radiation together. It's occasionally necessary when you have a lot of disease spilling out into the fat of the underarm of the axilla, but it's usually not necessary. It is critical to have communication between your doctors, uh, you know, that they talk about this and try to avoid it. And that then subsequently uh, discussing, discussing that with the patient or you, if, if that's the case may be. The trend is towards early intervention, which means if we get after it really early, there's much less chance you're gonna get swollen. It's towards improving prevention. So if somebody's going on a lot of plane flights or even just a few, maybe getting them to see the lymphedema people and getting a sleeve on before they ever get swollen because it's just, it's terrible to hear that somebody went up in a plane, reduced altitude or not altitude, reduced pressure and ended up with swelling the next day. And it could have been prevented. That, that's just never a story that we want to hear. And we're learning more and more about that. And, and the or lymphedema therapists are learning a lot more that allows them to better counteract that before it ever happens. But using those lymphedema specialists is also important for reducing some of the, the more severe cases. And we're gonna to get to that in our next slide. So there's a stage group for that one through four. One is uh, you can barely notice it, but if you measure it, it's there. Two is you can notice it even, even casually. Three is it's getting pretty big and kind of giving those little rolls that babies get sometimes, but we find those cute. And then stage four is obviously a markedly enlarged arm that's not going to be very functional and very difficult to get that under complete control without continued maintenance. So we absolutely want to catch this in stage one or two for that, just like we want to catch the breast cancers in stage one or two. So replacing, I'm going to be quick because we do want a little bit of time for questions if there are any Essentially, radiation may be um, able to replace node dissection. So instead of having a bigger uh, surgery in your underarm, uh, there's data from a trial called the Amarose trial that if those women were positive at the time of their surgery from just checking one node, but they didn't have any enlarged nodes, that radiation does just as well as, as surgery at keeping the cancer from coming back in the underarm. But importantly, the risk of that swelling and that bad swelling that I showed you is about half with the radiation versus the uh, dissection. Now, if somebody's got a big lymph node under their arm, we're probably still gonna ask them to have the dissection because again, the risks are very different. So you can't run out and say, hey, that doctor told me I never have to, have, no one that I know has to have uh, axillary surgery anymore, but there are definitely times where it's not necessary. We can use radiation in its place, and that may very well be safer. Uh, replacing mastectomy, well, that's how this all got started, but now we can reduce a lot of these bigger stage three tumors down to stage two or even stage one with chemotherapy up front, and they may not need a mastectomy, so there's better recovery time and less limitations and no need for reconstruction. And this is the last one, and then we'll get the conclusion and we'll move on. So who do we not need to treat or who may we not need to treat? So women who are 70 and older who are hormone receptor positive really don't have much difference in survival. Now, a 70 year old that's gonna to live to be 100 is a little different than a 70 year old that's gonna to live to be 79. But uh, in most cases, if you're 70 and older, you've got stage one or stage two, particularly stage one, it's hormone receptor positive, we probably could just 
not treat you and it'd be good. And, uh, you know, anytime we don't have to treat, we, we really shouldn't. Women who are 50 to 69, also hormone receptor positive, you'll see that as a trend with this. Uh, there is a difference in local control, meaning the chance of it coming back, but there's still not a huge difference in survival. So if you've got somebody who's got other illnesses, we call that comorbidities that might be life altering or life threatening, maybe they don't need it either, but you have to look at that on a case by case basis. Most women in the age group still get radiation. It's still recommended really small, non-invasive breast cancers that have good margins. So I saw somebody the other day that had a three millimeter tumor. She had eight millimeter margins. She was grade one. Her chances of coming back with that particular one are nearly zero. I can't make that better. It doesn't matter how hard I try. I just can't make it better. We're still using data that was derived in the 1990s to say that it cuts the, the chances of it failing in half, but there are just some situations where the risk is so low, it's just hard to say that we're going to even make half, and even that's not very much difference. And very good prognosis types of cancer. So there's one type is a mucinous carcinoma, but there are other types that just don't really come back, and it's very hard to make a case to give somebody even a week's worth of radiation that might be toxic if they weren't going to get a benefit out of it. So that's as important as anything else. And that's been where a lot of the data has been pushing. And that's sort of the, a new trend is more and more groups that maybe we're not getting the benefit that we, that we thought we were. And it's not because we weren't doing, they weren't doing well. It's just, they were doing so well already. Maybe we're just not being helpful. So the conclusions are newer techniques and reduced dose have maintained survival and control benefits uh, with radiation, but reducing toxicity. That's very important. That is the steady goal. You may not need radiation. That's also an evolutionary thing. And if you do, regardless, it should be very safe. And we should all feel that the therapy we get is going to be safe for us. So I'm going to stop with a little less time than I thought I would have and see if anybody's got any questions. It looks like some folks may be trying but are muted. So uh, Kim or Carol, do they need to, they need to request to be unmuted? Uh, no, they don't. Okay. Okay. I just, I saw a little something on my screen that said they might. So that's why I, I wanted to ask. Uh, so there is one question in the chat. Okay. How do you talk, how do you talk to your doctor about the idea that you may not, not need radiation? Well, I think it's just, uh, <laughs> You know, uh, doctors historically have not been terribly excited about being challenged, and that's, uh, we shouldn't be that way, but, but sometimes, you know, hey, I'm the doctor, I know better, and that's generally true, but not always true. I think it's just, you know, I think it's the easiest way to bring it up is I appear to have a really, um, I have a less aggressive tumor. I'm, say I'm older, I'm, I'm 72 years old, and, you know, I understand that you know, it may have a little higher chance coming back, but it's probably doesn't seem like it's going to make a big difference in my survival. What do you think about me not having treatment? I would hope that most people who do what I do would be very open to that, unless you were hormone receptor positive, a negative or something like that, or had a really close margin or some terrible, awful, fast growing disease, and they can give you a really good reason why not. It is always okay to have a second opinion. I mean, none of us like, you know, having somebody go get a second opinion, but I mean, I would do it if I didn't feel comfortable that I was getting my full range of options. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Is there anything else? I don't see anything else. All right. Well, I hope this was helpful. Again, you know, breast is always a tricky one to have, quote, new advances because we expect, you know, like uh, open heart surgery, you know, all of a sudden we can do all these wonderful things that we couldn't do before. And this has just been, again, a very slow, this is almost like the tortoise in the race. It's just a very slow progressive. We do get little bumps with like proton equipment that we all don't get to have. 
uh, and this, this uh, surface management and things like that. So there are little bumps, but it's really more of a set of bumps going, making things better than it is a huge leap. I think the last huge leap was, hey, it works as well as mastectomy for most women. And that was, again, almost 40 years ago. So it's not that we haven't made advances. They're just steady and slow as opposed to, to wow. <laughs> and so I appreciate everybody humoring me during this. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert. All right. Well, I appreciate everybody's attention and, and thank you for coming. And I hope I don't see you for real. But if I have to, then we'll definitely talk about those range of options. And you can always feel comfortable and God forbid you have to see me you you can always feel comfortable that we would we would be willing to entertain any reasonable option including maybe not doing something so is there anything else uh Carol or Kim that uh that I need to do or um no I think we're I think we're good um right. anybody who wants to make an appointment Dr. Gilbert um he can he is sees people at the Mitchell Cancer Institute. And of course that number is 251-410-1010 for an appointment. All right, well, again, you guys have a great afternoon. Enjoy this beautiful weather. Thank you, you too. Bye-bye.